Thanks, Mike. Uh, Chris and Sandy from uh, Christopher's Gardening and Nursing over in Sholo were nice enough to make the drive over here, and they're going to talk a little bit about composting and natural fertilizers and stuff. So, thanks for coming over, guys. I got to tell you, Bill's little deal on the uh, sprouting seeds, the gray hair, the hearing, man, I'm going to go and start eating sprouts. <laughs> Things are starting to fail. <laughs> Um, a lot of rabbit trails. I sit there, you know, I, I hear these speeches and, and you know, I, I kind of get excited. I, I've been in this business for 40 years, actually been in since I was six years old. My father had a nursery also, so this has kind of been my soul. And uh, uh, I have Christopher's Gardens Nursery in Lakeside, Arizona, on the other side of the hump. And uh, um, I still have a passion for what I do. I don't, I, when I go to work every day, I don't feel like I'm going to work. So I know that we're on a tight timeline right now, so I'll get to get to it here. Um, when you talk about soils, I had a great soils teacher in college, and he was really kind of one of those kind of guys that uh, kind of reeled you in, put the hook in your lip. And uh, I said to him one time, I said, you know, what about our acid soils underneath our pine forests? And he goes, he says, bring a sample. So we took it to the lab, and I went to Arizona State University, and uh, we ran tests in, in, in the lab, and make a long story short, uh, all of our soils in the entire southwest are alkaline. He was setting the hook deep in my lip, and, uh, um, and it, it worked. You know, it was good, good eye-opening uh, exercise. All of your soils really in this area, New Mexico, really where we are on the, on the other side of the mountain, when you go lower off the mountain, are incredibly devoid of organic matter. Um, Sp Springerville, very, very alkaline, very, very devoid of organic matter. You can uh, save yourselves $45 and not do a soil test. I've seen a hundred of them and it, they're all the same. So my, my thrust on, on really growing um, and building your soils, Sandy and I have raised beds around our house and uh, we built up our soil year after year, but we will take all the organic matter we can get our hands on, i.e. oak leaves, you know. I have guys that shred their oak leaves, bring them over to the house, and I'll take and I'll put, you know, 12 inches of oak leaves and, you know, or 18 inches of oak leaves and just take and just lightly tumble them into my grow boxes in the wintertime. By spring, they're already composted, they're already digested. And, uh, and if you think you do that one time, I do it annually. So. We use just a, a boatload of organic matter. Yes, sir. How do you keep them from blowing away? <laughs> That's what I say. I just say lightly rototill them in. You just kind of tumble them in so you basically have a little soil to start breaking them down. Um, I, I know that we're, we're kind of leaning towards the organic lilt. I can give you another uh, true story. I'm one of those kind of guys, and I'm not a pesticide guy. And I really don't like them. Steve will attest to it. We have bees, and I'm... Uh, I'm really, I sell them just because I'm a retail, <laughs> and, um, but the bottom line is I'm not a super fan of pesticides. I really do not have a problem with putting uh, commercial grade fertilizer in my garden. Whether it comes from a dead fish or a factory, um, nitrogen, phosphate, potash are all organic compounds. But leaning that direction, we brought natural fertilizers over. Um, the truth is, in my garden, I use 16, 16, 16, and I grow fabulous gardens every year. But we do have a complete line of organic fertilizers. Um, Happy Frog is the one that, uh, um, I hate to shock everybody here, but I think uh, we have a huge population of people that are growing marijuana in our area, and they have a tendency of loving this product. So, <laughs> my children are all raised and successful individuals in life, so I kind of turn a blind eye when these guys come in and start buying this stuff up. Um, other companies, uh, Fertilome, Natural Guard, have pro uh, products that are very, very comparable and a lot cheaper in price. And, uh, you know, blood meal, bone meal, Fish emulsion. We have. Uh, I brought a thing of uh, uh, dehydrated chicken manure, and I, I was a little chagrined to drag it in here because it has a little bouquet to it. Too. <laughs> so I, I actually, on the way home, I threw it in Sandy's car, and she goes, "I think we better take the pickup truck." <laughs> <laughs> and, and building soils too. On the market now, there's all kinds of mycorrhizae inoculants. Basically, a, a, a fungal. Um, 
inoculant that uh, builds good root systems. And there's a, a lot of these products actually, Black Gold and Happy Frog um, or Fox Farm products are blending a lot of those, those profiles into their soils. So um, good route to go to you know, start working, building your soils up. Um, there's a lot of products that are bagged on the market. We have a we have a deal too that uh, we make our own soils really on site, and uh, I take and I blend coconut fiber, organic mulch, forest mulch, and about our topsoil. What they call topsoil in our area is really not topsoil, but I'll put about 25% just topsoil in there, and we blend. Uh, that's really what we do all of our growing on site um, at the nursery, and we actually sell that in a, uh, a half a cubic yard bag. And it's it's really it's a good product, and it's half the price what you're paying in a bag. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually building grow boxes and you're trying to mm -hmm. uh, you know put together some beds, it's a it's a cheaper route, and I got to tell you, it works because I've been using it for years. So it's it's pretty good product. We have our, our mulch is bagged under our label. Um, not all mulches are created equally. There's a lot of mulches that are just very very woody, you know, uh, forest products. Ours, it's a, a much heavier product, and it's uh, it's stabilized um, with a fertilizer. And I got to tell you, I know that I'm kind of patting myself on the back, but that's a our product's a little bit better than what you're getting at box stores. So uh, you got to take it. I should have taken a pocket knife and cut it open, let you guys all feel. Like <laughs> but, uh, then there's products on the market too. Square foot gardening soils. Those are soils that they've taken and uh, uh, blended. I the the. Gentleman was it Mel? Mel's mix. Yeah, Mel's mix. He's the guy that wrote the book on square, you know, square foot gardening, and he was a real stickler what went under his label. And there's a, a company that's blending his mix, and it's really a pretty good soil product. But you're looking at like fifteen ninety nine for a bag, so it's it's not inexpensive. <coughs> it's a, it's a fairly pricey deal. Um, so you can you can build your own soils, taking just uh, like 25% of your existing soil here and blending a boatload of organic matter to it and you can build your grow boxes <coughs> yourself too. So um, the one thing that you over on this side of the mountain and as you go to Snowflake and Taylor and Lower, I have a ranch in Hunt and uh, make long story short, terrible alkaline. Uh, it's as alkaline as Phoenix and Tucson, you know, very calcareous soil. Always use, you can use, uh, you know, a good home remedy, you can run vinegar in your lines. You can run, uh, that's a good acid. Um, this is a little tricky deal here. This is a chelated iron ion, it's called Keyrex. And we will take and we'll put it with an acid base water soluble fertilizer. If you've noticed your leaves over here, oftentimes you'll get a dark green, you know, vein in the leaf and the rest of the leaf is very very pale and yellow mm -hmm. that's iron chlorosis that's textbook alkalinity problem and this was really the deal when we were kids this used to be called sequestrian 138 my dad had a citrus orchard and as a kid we used that stuff all the time it was very very pricey you could usually never get it over the counter they have it in the consumer bag now and we have it on the on the shelf high-powered chelated iron ion. It's not tied up by your soil and it will counteract iron chlorosis and alkalinity. So, good little trick. That's uh, the stuff that I'm running through my lines. People will come into my greenhouses and go, oh my gosh, your plants look great. I cheat. That's it. <laughs> That's what we use. We run, we run water-soluble 20-20-20 and sequestering 138 through my lines and that keeps things going great. So. <coughs> Um, like I say, I got to just keep preaching more and more on the the organic matter, and you're the um, that's what I do. Oh, thank you. That's why I brought Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a great, great product. And you'll have you've, you've I don't know if you've been to some of these seminars where they have this little bucket for seventy five bucks of humic acid. Um, same stuff. Mined in New Mexico in 1599, 1799, instead of $75 for a little bucket. Humic acid, fabulous stuff for putting in your grow boxes and your gardens. Basically, compressed um, peat moss, organic matter in almost uh, 
uh, it's, it's a carbon form, but it's, it's called humic acid, and uh, uh, it says that you can put one, or this does like 2,000 square feet. I gotta tell you, I put a whole bag in my grow box, has no impact on plants, and this is a great little product, and inexpensive. Tell so, them what it does. What's that? Tell them what it does. Well, basically, humic acid, because of our alkalinity, you know, it, it breaks into an acid base, and it's compressed organic matter, so it just, jacks your soil up. It's a good good start. Um, soil activator, I've been using that every year in my garden. And like I say, I've got little 15 by 24 foot grow boxes at the house, and I'll chuck a whole bag, not 2,000 square feet, I'll put a whole bag in that grow box. And uh, we have pretty phenomenal gardens. I have neighbors that come by and just lurk. <laughs> but I have to do that, I'm in the business. <laughs> I don't know what the timeline is. Where are we? You're good. good. you got about five more minutes cool. if you need it. Okay, on the line of heirloom seeds. I've had a tomato seed since I was 19 years old. It's called a, a Harley's Pink German. A gentleman back in Arkansas dropped out of college for a semester, worked in a chicken kill facility, and he gave me those seeds. Very unique. There's none. I've tried, you know, pink Germans, and they're not the same. I've got that seed. I almost lost the seed source years ago, and I made cuttings on that tomato plant and saved that seed source, and I've had that since I was 19 years old. And I'm starting to get gray, so it kind of explains how long I've had that seed. <laughs> I absolutely concur with you. I think that at the end of this deal, it's going to be God, guns, and seeds, and I think we should all be saving seeds. Uh, we have, Sandy will probably kill me, but I mean, my garage is full of... Uh, snap-on bottles that have bean seeds and I at the end of the season I will take the you know the end of the season snipes on my green beans I'm in the business I have access to tons of seed I still save all, a lot of my seeds and uh, and grow them annually so I think we should all every one of you here should have jars and be saving seed yes just, just a question about cross-pollination mm -hmm. like squash plants <laughs> in particular even if they're heirloom, they will cross pollinate. Oh, absolutely. And so, is there a is there a solution to that problem? For isolation. Saviors? Just yeah. isolate isolation. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. Keep and them far apart. That's a really good question because a cucurbit, which is a, a squash, crosses very easy. So if you've got butternuts and you've got sweet meats in the same garden area, those bees are getting back and forth, and you're going to have goofy seeds come out of those things. So isolation is the key. But there's some fabulous heirloom old squash seeds uh, sweet meat uh, we, we keep those and save those all the time and you know I'm kind of a, a winter squash snapper I like winter squash so but we save them all in a tomato <laughs> is a very interesting seed and it, it, it can go through the sanitary district system it can go through sludge and be composted, and the next thing you know, if you use it in your potting mix, you have tomato plants coming up in your house. It's one that does not digest really easily. I had a buddy that has Treeland Nursery in Mesa, and he was laughing, and I said, yeah, I said, I ran a little bit of, you know, uh, sanitary district sludge in my, uh, my mix for, you know, canning trees. And he goes, ha ha, he says, Watch, you're gonna have tomatoes in every pot in the spring, and sure enough. <laughs> I was collecting tomatoes all season long. So. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, over the next slide, you can, out of the sanitary thing, you can buy uh, the sewer thing. Uh, I think last week, Texas was about $60 a ton. I don't know what it is now. No, it's really inexpensive. It's only like, a, it's like eight, ten dollars a yard. Okay. Well, and it's, it's compost. It's what they do is they take, uh, uh, sanitary sludge right. and they run it through a thing we have a rotary digester and they run carbon they just run basically uh, uh, cardboard and paper through there blend that together and then they compost it even further they'll they'll take and windrow it and seal it and have it cook and compost and it's, it's not how's it for your garden for building it up with this <laughs> My rhubarb's growing in it. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure that uh, the purists would sit there and go, oh my gosh, if you looked at the deal, there's probably some metals in it or what have you. But some other than the twitch, I'm fine. I was in Japan. They do it more direct than that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
Yeah, I really don't have any issue with it. I've used it a lot. Oh, absolutely. By all means. Yes, sir. I'm pretty much a novice when it comes to a lot of this soil composition and stuff. Uh, I'm starting a pretty large garden this year, but you talk about pH and stuff, I don't know at all what, what you know, you talk about pH, I, I don't even know what you're supposed to have or, you know, you, you, you made it sound like kind of alluded to the fact that it needs to be slightly acidic. At, uh, or towards towards the middle, towards, you know, base, rather than, or uh, not really base, but neutral. Yeah, neutral. Yeah, neutral. Yeah, yeah, towards, towards neutral. Um, in the east, if we lived in the east, they have a lot of acid rain, and, and you, it's acid. Another thing, too, is that these I've got farm stores that have come in here have pallets of lime sitting in front of it. Do not do that to your soil. They have no clue. They're, they're shipping that stuff out in the east. It's the absolute antithesis of what you need for your garden. When you just have, like, natural compost, like manure, compost of manure and stuff like that, what does that tend to be? It'll actually be... Uh, Possibly, maybe lightly to the acid side um, because of the urea in there, but uh, um, it's not bad. Nothing, nothing to fear. Yes. What about ash from your fireplace to put on your garden? No, no, no. Take your ash, cool it for months in buckets, throw it in the dumpster, and send it to the. Because you know, <laughs> you do not you need ash here. Forms a real strong base. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we want just the opposite. Run that, yeah. You know, go down to Walmart, get a big old cheap jug of uh, vinegar, and put light vinegar or something of that nature. And if you have, you know, a real problem. problem. Yeah. What about you know, like tomatoes and peppers need calcium? Isn't that does calcium produce like an alkaline? Yeah, but alkalinity can tie calcium up so tight that it's it's bound and can't get to your tomato plants. Because like I I started some container. Um, tomatoes and, and they had some blossom and rot and, right. and so I, I wasn't sure do you have a solution for that or liquid calcium yeah you, there's a liquid calciums and they're really inexpensive on the market and you can put that in there uh, into your mix and just it would feed with it calcium nitrate bone meal all of those would be fine so mm -hmm. <coughs> blossom and rot is yeah <coughs> calcium deficiency what is the name of your own uh, brand of mulch over there? Christopher's, Christopher's Gardens Mulch. <laughs> <laughs> Very catchy name. I'm a rich man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your goodies in the bag are really neat, but if we have an isolation event, we can't get to your goodies in the bag at your store, what do we do? Well, that's a really good question. Just Raise short chickens. of storing dead fish in your garage, it's going to be an issue. You know? Raise chickens. Uh, what's this? Raise chickens. Yeah. 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 So that's a great one, too. Yeah, you know, right. yeah Sandy's really right. Uh, God love my wife. She doesn't ask for anything in life but a pack of chickens. And uh, um, we use that stuff all the time. She will clean out the chicken pen. And uh, um, really, I'll throw grass clippings in the pen because it you know, makes for a good yellow orange egg, the chlorophyll off of the, the grass clippings. But they basically, they have got to compost that into a clot. I'll take the rototiller in the pen, rip all that up, and chuck it in my grow boxes, too. It's a good route to go. But there again, the issue is, uh, as far as sustainability or, you know, if you don't have a pack of chickens, uh, yeah, it's, it's, but I don't think that's, it's too daunting in that you can just, you know, keep storing. You can have a compost bin, so you can be tangibly composting yourself. Grass clippings. You know, oak leaves, all these, you know, cottonwood leaves, fine. I have no issue with it. I have no issue with uh, pine needles other than they have a lot of resin in them and they don't compost well. If you take them, you run them through a shredder, um, it busts them down and they'll actually compost pretty well. And I have no problem putting that in the uh, grow box. Mm -hmm. So, one thing too is you'll always hear that, you know, nothing will grow under a cedar tree. Well, the only reason it doesn't grow under a cedar tree is because there's such a thick clot of... Uh, you know, leaf mm -hmm. trash from those cedars that things can't grow. I have, I, there was an older gentleman that years ago used to come into my place, had grow boxes, and used to rake all that leaf or needle trash out from underneath the cedars. He used to grow fabulous gardens with that by putting that organic matter in there. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. In St. John's, uh, they use an ionic exchange to uh, remove the carbon caps and carbonate out of the water and they inject a salt. Uh, how is that uh, good for your plants? Not great. <laughs> Salts are terrible. You know? And uh, yeah, if salts don't leach. The only way you can get rid of salt is leaching it, so you have an issue there. And uh, 
really my soil on my ranch and hunt, um, I have pretty bad salt deposits on that too. So we're, we're done. Kill me. Come sorry. You got to get the big can. <laughs>